Uh, hi, everyone. I suppose we can start the workshop now. Uh, just to quickly introduce ourselves. Uh, hi, my name is Chris. I'm the coach of Team Latvia. I'm also have been debating BP from uh, CNS Po, as you already know me from maybe previous workshops. Uh, today I'll be joined by Henrik for the second time, uh, and we'll be talking about arts. Henrik, do you have introductory remarks about yourself? Uh, yeah, hi. So my name is Henrik. I am the competitive training coordinator here at Nedbra University, and I also am the co-coach of the Latvian National World Schools team. Yeah, so cool. Today we're going to talk about uh, a topic that most debaters usually dread when they see this motion, any motion that's associated with arts, because they do pop up less often, but when they do, it's very important to know how to debate them. Otherwise, uh, people get stuck or don't know how to actually reach for certain impacts in the debate because they feel like art is not that relevant or doesn't deal with like the most uh, impactful issues in society. So we're going to try to just like look at the main aspects of debating art. Uh, so here's essentially the outline that we have today. Firstly, we're going to talk about why people care about art in the first place and why do we like why should we care about making art accessible to every single person? Uh, and that's kind of already touches upon why art should have impact or does have impact. Secondly, we're going to talk about messaging in arts, um, how that occurs or like for what messages should we look for. Thirdly, we're going to talk about how arts actually shape human actions and what are the main burdens of proof that you have to neatly follow in your argumentation in arts motions in order to be impactful in the round and also like prime the judges uh, to credit the impacts that you claim. Uh, then Henrix is going to talk a bit more about art markets in general, about how new art can break through and all of these arguments that usually are more to the economic side of it. Um, but that also makes a lot of sense because, you know, if we want to make art accessible, then we are going to discuss how we do that. And lastly, we're just going to go through a motion analysis uh, on a particular uh, motion that's been very popular regarding art. And Henrik is going to walk you through the steps of argumentation that are like more most prevalent in these types of motions. Uh, so let's kick it off with the first thing. Also, uh, if you have any questions at any point, feel free to post them in the chat. Of course, we can have a short QA at the end. So let's dive into the first uh, thing that we're going to talk about today. It's why do people care about art? And here I've kind of divided out the three most um, important things to note. First, uh, art simply has the aesthetic value of viewing it. This is probably the like least impactful thing that you can say that it just has the aesthetic value and nothing else, right? That people like looking at it, you see a nice picture, you just like evaluate it based on the skill or, or the artistry involved uh, in, in producing it. Uh, the two other ones are a lot more deeper. The second one is the Kalu, which is basically what this art artwork makes you think, right? When you watch a movie and you, when you follow the plot closely, right? You're going to essentially uh, think about a certain concept, etc. The third one is the most impactful one because it's not necessarily only enjoying the aesthetics of it or kind of thinking actively about the artwork in general, right? But it's experiential value that people assign uniquely to themselves uh, through this artwork. What I mean by that is that all of us have certain lived experiences that we can associate ourselves with. And when we look at a piece of artwork, right, it produces some sort of emotions within us, right? When you're looking a, at an, for example, even at an ad, right, that you see on a TV, uh, you follow the plot or you follow the symbols there, and you probably associate yourself with that person in the ad or like with that situation, right? It makes you buy a certain product. You can think about this like, you know, whenever people have certain clothes or like certain status symbols or brands, like in James Bond movies, that makes people actually act in the end because they have this experiential value associated with, with that particular form of art or that particular plot that you might see. Similarly, you can think about experiential value whenever you see like sacral art, right? When you go into a church and there's, you know, a painting of God, etc. It makes like people experience much something much more deeper uh, than just the aesthetic value or even just like the cognitive value of thinking about things or thinking about the message uh, of the art itself. Um, then the question that follows after this is essentially why do we care about making art accessible? And I think that it's also easy to make a, like a 
just freer again, right? First, it's because we often want to drive social change, right? We make art in order to produce a certain effect on people and people to maybe change their opinion or do a certain thing. Right? I think that this is very uh, like well known, like the art of Banksy, right? Where he uses art as a like political commentary in order to like, for example, change people's views on certain matters, especially he's been prevalent in the like Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, or you can think about performative art during protests, right? That can also be considered as a form of art because it turns people attention, people's attention to like very hot um, button issues and tries to like show the humanity behind it, right? You, if, if you think about uh, people like painting blood on like embassies, right, of countries that they don't like just to like kind of show a form of protest and associate that with the greater idea of like human sacrifice, et cetera, et cetera. I think that makes like the message behind it or the narrative much more powerful, right? As opposed to just telling it via, via a newspaper because the value of art is, you know, kind of connected to this cognitive experiential value for individuals. The second one is that art is a status signaler uh, it kind of signals the cultural capital we have, right? So why do we want people to have uh, access to art? Because they're essentially going to be often like um, judged on their tastes, right? Uh, and judged on how much they know about art, right? So, sorry. Uh, so whenever you talk about like I don't know, well-known literature pieces, whatever, um, if you don't understand those common references, you're essentially excluded for, from certain social circles, right? And this is kind of probably very well connected to the part that Hendricks is going to talk about later, which is going to be about like markets in general, right? And why we should care about certain prices or accessibility of that art. Then lastly, um, and I think that most importantly, is that art is connected to, well, emotional experiences. And here I want to say that like, whenever you think that art arguments are fluffy or not important, or whenever you think that art is just like, um, a separate sphere of life that individuals sh like shouldn't or wouldn't care about. Uh, actually, a lot of the times, art is something that makes you feel certain things that you otherwise wouldn't. Why is this important? Because it makes you feel certain moods or certain predispositions, or like helps you deal with certain experiences that you have had outside art, like in the real life, right? And here you can make the connection. For example, like whenever you're, uh, you know going back home and you've had a bad day, right? And you're listening to your favorite soundtrack, it actually produces certain feelings that help you cope with a stressful day, right? So it has a real world impact on how individuals feel about themselves or how often they reflect on their life, right? As opposed to like directly changing it, it's kind of like individuals are able to internalize feelings or emotions that uh, they have from this artwork. And therefore, you know, it kind of changes their actions in the real world uh, afterwards as well. Um, so from the individual like level of, of, of making art accessible, I think we can then turn to the second question about like, how do we see sort of like messaging in arts, right? And like broader social norms here. Uh, I think I've kind of listed four things here uh, broadly. First, it's basically like whenever we observe art, we see a form of representation of society, right? I think this is not groundbreaking. However, um, it's it's sort of like something that people probably forget to mention in you know their arguments about art right because whenever you firstly see certain movies or see certain characters um if you're a, a mi minority individual in in some sort of a state where a lot of the like individuals that are represented in, in art are like predominantly white right you're probably not going to enter the art world art world in the first place or even any other profession right where you know these protagonists are always white uh, because you think that it's not how the real world work, works right because the only way we can visualize certain things is actually through art or through movies telling us how it's going to look like if every single woman you see um you know on on a seat like a company board in a movie is white and quite rich or conservative you're probably not going to like even try to like reach those heights as a minority woman, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, it's also like, um, you know, uh, produces certain expectations of how people should act, right? This goes in terms of like relationships, right? When, whenever you're kind of, you know, 
because uh, every single artwork kind of aims for you to associate yourself with a certain certain person or take a certain perspective of what's wrong and right. So the way you portray that also matters. For example, a lot of the like, I don't know, social norms of how boys should behave in front of women or how they should treat women could be attributed to basically just like how it's like portrayed in, in series and movies, et cetera, et cetera. Or like whether or not you have um, uh, stereotypes about LGBTQ individuals as being like very flamboyant, et cetera, right? And when individuals see this and they don't understand why their lived experiences don't correspond to this popular portrayal, they might like start questioning themselves or feel very uncomfortable or feel like they have to conform to this image because that's, you know, what the pop popular media shows them as the majoritarian norm, right? Thirdly, um, it's, you can say that this just like leads to normalization of these issues, right? That it, like, because it's so prevalent, and because usually the way these messages are constructed are majoritarian, right? Because it's very hard not to conform to this one central message that appears in, in, in arts, right? Or like in the predominant artwork that uh, like every single person like tries to cater, like, uh, cater to, right? Because, you know, if you have Hollywood, it's usually very hard for them to even sometimes include very different narratives about the same issue, right? When you end up uh, getting basically this normalization of one uh, particular narrative. Um, the, the, the counter to that is that sometimes, um, well, you can break off a certain niche in that social norm by experiencing the margins of it. So for example, uh, like uh, a, a black woman being a bond agent or as the new protagonist would be something that people would maybe actually like because it's something new in and of itself, right? And so it kind of breaks apart from this norm and therefore even might get consumed more, right? So you can kind of play this normalization narrative and see uh, how these social norms actually work because sometimes in art, uh, art has the like potential power of, of liberating certain uh, social norms or like breaking cer certain social norms. And then lastly, it's not only about like present, right? But you might get a lot of debates about history as well, right? About how art shapes the views on the past. Uh, a good example is just um, a lot of like history movies, right? About like wars and how it portrays certain countries as being like more like heroic or glorifying certain conflicts as opposed to treating them as they are, or as, as having a lot of human sacrifice and, you know, uh, not exonerating certain leaders for going into this war in the first place, right? So you can think about how this shapes our views about violence and like state enacted violence nowadays going to war nowadays even as well. And then the last thing I want to talk about before I give word to Hendrix is um, like, okay, we've, we've talked about a lot of the things that art can change, right? We've talked about why we should care about and why we should make it accessible. The next thing that I kind of have compiled here is like why you should care, like what are the things that you should show in order to like, show that there's actually an impact of the artwork that people see. And I think that there are four things that you have to do as a burden of proof, right? Because art motions are essentially narratives motions to some extent, because you essentially are dealing with individuals perceiving something, interpreting it into their mind and then acting upon it, right? So firstly, what you have to do is really, really describe the message or of the artwork. And you don't, don't just like throw around certain words as glorification like of something right is is visible in this artwork but really explain like what about that artwork is it that individuals see right so for example when you enter the Sistine Chapel right why is it that it's so impressive right you can describe oh that you know you know that people have spent so much time like like uh, detailing every single piece of that artwork and you realize how much money and resources has and grandeur has been like spent in building on uh, like this this one thing right so you probably like feel humility towards this institution that is like the Catholic Church or whatever when you enter in, in, into this chapel, right? So this is kind of the message that you can describe in more details as opposed to just like saying that it exists, right? The second thing then you have to say is like, what is the likely interpretation of that message that you see and whether or not individuals before they perceive that artwork in the first place had a different idea in mind, right? And whether or not like they're going to interpret the message the way you kind of thought they would. Thirdly, the question is, what is the delta? And here it's like whether or not the individuals actually change their mind, right? Because you have a lot of like, a lot of the times you have just like 5% change in the discourse. And the question is like, okay, but why does that change like 95% of the discourse, right? That still remains in the person's head and affects their actions, right? So you have to be really, really careful about showing like why this one artwork or like why this one narrative dominates every every other pre-existing narrative in society 
or why it takes those others over or like why it's more powerful in comparison because it doesn't really exist in a vacuum. And lastly, it's about whether or not that, uh, that message that you see from the artwork is actually going to lead to some sort of uh, an action in real life, right? Whether or not it's gonna have a practical impact or whether or not it's simply gonna, you know, uh, like change a person's thoughts, but they're not, not really going to act upon it, right? So I think that the last step is kind of the one that individuals usually miss when they construct arguments about art or about narratives. They usually just, you know, miss this la last crucial step of telling, okay, after you've seen everything, after you've interpreted in your mind, what is the likelihood that now you're going to go on the street and protest because you just saw a, an artwork that, you know, goes against uh, some sort of like a political regime or has a political message or social commentary, right? So you have to kind of try to think about like why the mood and motivation of this person really leads to them doing something. And once you've kind of at least talked about all of these four steps, I think that argumentation becomes a lot, lot more powerful. Um, if there are no questions or like nobody wants me to stop right at this exact moment, I'm gonna give a word to Henrik and he's gonna talk more about art markets. Right, fantastic. I think a lot of what Chris already said is going to be integrated later when we talk about the a specific motion in which I think it's going to be very clear how uh, all of the burdens of proof gets fulfilled in a bit. But before that, let's talk about art markets. As much as people would not like to concede to the statement that we live in a capitalistic society and probably a lot of arts motions are still dominated by economics or actions that people take in, in, in terms of buying or selling art or actually consuming art are still governed by economics, hence the slide on arts markets. Let's start with the first one. There's a lot of investments uh, in arts, and it sometimes is differentiated by why people invest in art in the first place. Um, a cool fact you can use in debates is that actually uh, using art as a financial investment that could appreciate in the long term is quite a low priority for people who buy art. It's usually dominated by things like aesthetics or con cognitive uh, communication to a specific artwork or even things that like uh, things like personal merits, for example. If the art's been produced by a, uh, a person of color um, and someone else is a person of color, that might be also a valid justification for buying or like usually an incentive for buying an artwork, which usually trumps the financial investment. The second thing about artworks is there's this delineation in the world that Western artworks are usually considered to be more valuable because of the Western influence in the history of art. Uh, that's, that's why they're sometimes a lot easier to use as collaterals. Um, a cool example for this as well is the recent trend for, um, for art investors in the Asian countries trying to buy a lot of Western artworks to use them later as collaterals in supporting other parts of the businesses. Um, which also signifies the difference in how the global society perceives the value of art between different nations or, let's say, continents exist. The third one, uh, talking about economic trends, uh, there's a very, very clear trend in the value of historic works uh, like Russian, Chinese, or generally Islamic art uh, rising with increased wealth in those countries. That is possibly what might explain the previous statement about Western artworks also being valued higher and therefore used as a better collateral against. But it also poses some problems of the, the, the societal perception of the value of art from specific minority artists or cultures that are not that rich in general compared to, let's say, uh, to, let's say the West. Um, fourthly, uh, quite crucially as well, is that what teams sometimes miss is that some art markets are very niche, small, uh, in, 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 in especially in terms of artworks rather than the combined value of those artworks in a niche. That, that is perhaps what plays into consideration quite a lot when talking about market saturation. That is to say that at one point, perhaps, people are trying to sell or buy a lot of artworks of the same kind, meaning in the same sort of niche uh, of art, therefore leading to a either massive decrease or increase of the art price. Uh, an example for this was, I think, a very rich couple uh, 20 roughly years ago uh, was divorced and then they tried to split basically the artworks that they had. And both of them assumed that it would be the easiest way to do that through basically selling all of those artworks. They chose not to because that wouldn't 
with the massive market saturation. That is quite important, uh, this statement, because it governs the way sometimes how financial investors who invest in art specifically might be um, persuaded or vice versa to sell specific artworks or to generally invest in a specific type of uh, art niche. And lastly, the good old question of how much does art cost and do we know how much art costs actually? Uh, quick answer is no. Uh, but there's a couple of ideas that we can speculate upon, try to suggest, at least in the debates, whether or not, uh, especially in debates that try to delineate specifically which artworks, are, sorry, that is to say, like, is an artwork justified um, in terms of, let's say, its value to be a value that's, I don't know, let's say a million, right? Uh, but uh, two statements here, uh, two statements here. Firstly, the value of art nearly exclusively uh, is is governed in comparison with similar artworks. That is to say, if we could find in a niche, let's say abstract art, uh, an artwork that is considered to be the benchmark and then valuating it against different other artworks might set um, and might give us some estimate of how expensive said artwork should be. And if not available, usually the galleries, which is quite an interesting thing, they try to, well, uh, when publishing it, try to evaluate it. A crucial caveat here is that generally art from unknown artists is valued considerably lower than art from really prestige artists. That is because usually it offset the risk, uh, the, the risk of a loss, which might be um, which might be uh, gained because people sometimes might not like a specific artwork or a PR stunt or stuff like that. That's usually how we assess how art might be influenced by economics and, and, and how it governs actions of people, uh, especially in the, let's say, uh, in the high end of the food chain of art, that is to say, basically obtaining artworks and, uh, and uh, making them your own, or buying, that is to say. Um, I think that's perhaps it for now. So let's switch gears to the motion analysis. Right, so the way that's gonna work is I'm gonna give you a motion. I've already prepared the case for it and I'm just gonna run through you guys. Um, so the motion for the night is gonna be, this house believes that it is morally permissible to consume art regardless of the artist's personal background. A very popular and a very classic motion. Uh, to suggest that perhaps we should um, we should set some standards as a society whether, uh, based on who's done the art and whose artwork it is, and perhaps assign a higher lower, lower value depending on that. So let's look at what may be the possibly the most accessible arguments for all four teams in a BP debate. Right, I know this slide looks very wordy, but uh, let's just start with OG in chronological order. Let's wake, work our way through. Chris, if you have anything you want to add or someone has any questions, put them in the chat or try to unmute you. Perhaps, yeah. Uh, all right, let's start with OG. So one may say that there's no capacity for most bigoted artists to perpetuate their coercive narratives anymore because most of them are dead. That is to suggest that the most amount of work uh, in, in art and most artworks that are still prominent to this day uh, have been created in the past, uh, and now the artists might be dead already, that is to say. Also, because um, um, some of the narratives that uh, might be especially bigoted usually are no longer considered to be a norm. Therefore, they do not influence artworks to the same extent. So you might suggest that actually perpetuation of those concerned, uh, coercive narratives is no longer a concern of ours. Uh, secondly, that we usually don't value people within a universal moral framework, but rather value them uh, within a certain proximity to us. There's an example. We might not care that much about people dying somewhere else in the world as much as we might if someone dies, let's say, in this room at, at this exact moment. Therefore, the link between the consumption of bigoted art and the acts upon uh, portrayed values might be unlikely. I think this ties very well with what Chris told you already about trying to prove why specific narratives or an internalization of a narrative is likely or unlikely to lead to an action. There we've basically tried to prove that it doesn't because of the proximity effects that people usually uh, have to others and how it governs the extent to which we're willing to take action. In terms of opening opposition, uh, in response to that, we might say that we actually give more capital 
of big data artists to continue making uh, some form of arts. Notice that it already considers uh, uh, the fact that they might still be able to do that, uh, as opposed to OG's first argument saying that mostly doesn't affect art that much. Uh, and there's two reasons why we should care. First, that there's a public obligation for us to prevent active harm. Um, for people trying to act on bigoted narratives, we usually as a society consider that to be a bad thing, so we try to limit it. Uh, and secondly, that perhaps the background of the artists affects the value of art, meaning if we still consider uh, a bigoted form of art to be of high value, um, we might attribute that value to similar artworks um, from different artists, artificially making basically the artwork. Um, more expensive or more valuable. Second thing we can consider is that uh, art can be considered the most truthful form of expression. That is, I think Chris has already talked about this, uh, about testing government legitimacy and testing social narratives. Therefore, when people internalize arts, we may suggest that the transfer of bigotry or like coercive narratives is likely to be high because people assume it to be the frontier of truth in the society in general. Therefore, put a lot of um, trust in artists to um, drive social narratives or try to disprove the legitimacy or actually prove the legitimacy of certain ones. Uh, then going back again to schools and governments, perhaps some of that material will clash with the OO, uh, but more as to show you how specific arguments in back half in our arts debates can be developed better, is the first claim might be that most people engage with art in a non-cognitive level uh, because of let's say two reasons. Firstly, they don't have the capacity. For example, they've never experienced those artworks before. They don't know what they're supposed to mean or, for example, how to see what the underlying message of an artist was in a, in a certain artwork. Or perhaps they don't want to. They just like to see how a picture looks, that a picture looks nice on their wall. And that's basically it. They're happy about that. Therefore, you could say that on a cognitive level, the transfer of narratives between the artist and the people consuming it is unlikely to happen. Therefore, therefore, um, acting upon internalized narratives doesn't happen as well. Um, but secondly, trying to eliminate all possible cases, perhaps people still might engage with art cognitively. Uh, they're likely to be skeptical about it because one, they might notice that the artwork is bigot bigoted, therefore try to be skeptical about why is that the case? And perhaps it's not justified uh, that the narrative is being um, um, proliferated through the artwork. But secondly, perhaps the public perception of uh, racism is bad in, in general society. So people usually are quite reluctant in vo voicing um, coercive narratives in the public. Therefore, they're unlikely perhaps also to uh, act on them and they're likely to be skeptical to begin with. And lastly, in closing opposition, we could suggest that if these people are not tackled, they can still change the narratives on what's access, uh, acceptable in the art, art market, therefore changing the demand or perhaps even supply of, uh, of artworks that promote coercive narratives. That might be of three reasons. Firstly, that the saturation of markets that I talked about previously might happen. That is to say that perhaps there's so many artworks at one point that have coercive messages in them that people now see that there's just a lot of them and therefore engagement with them becomes inevitable at certain points. Secondly, we might claim that it crowds out minority art because just when you have 10, let's say, uh, artworks that are promoting cursive narratives and only now one that is of, uh, trying to dispute that narrative, let's say, or just in general a minority artwork, it might be hard to reach them. Uh, and lastly, that persuasion is sometimes aided by appeal to specific groups. Um, this is perhaps not the best example, but an example that shows how artists might try to persuade people to like or empathize with their artworks more. For example, by changing the key to minor to, uh, to emphasize sadness or to artificially increase the extent of a certain emotion. Uh, therefore, in addition to limited time for people to engage with all forms of art or all possible explanations, of specific narratives in artworks, they, the, the bigoted ones are likely to be normalized and therefore in the long term leads to acceptance of said narratives. So this is, I'd say, a simple summary of how an art debate might be out. Uh, already, I think to a large extent, following the burden Chris talked to you about and specifically trying to prove the link between 
internalizing a specific narrative from an artwork and then whether or not acting uh, upon that narrative. Right, if Chris, you have anything to add, I think that's going to be it. Yeah, I, I guess I don't have anything specific to add unless there are specific questions from the audience, not only about the said motion or the mechanisms here on the slide, but anything that we talked about previously or whether or not you have motions that you struggled with uh, in art specifically, and if you want to talk about them or ask certain questions about argumentation in them. Yeah, I suppose it might be quite hard to ask questions right now, given the amount of material we've uh, covered. But yeah, if you just have anything about arts motions in general, that's also fine. Uh, okay, if, if there are no uh, further questions, I guess you can stop sharing the slides. And uh, thank you guys all for coming.